National Security Advisor John Bolton is out of the White House. El Salvador feminist protests against the, the reopening of Evelyn Hernandez's case. And the Israeli Prime Minister has said he will annex large parts of the West Bank if re-elected next week. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. U.S. President Donald Trump has sacked his national security advisor, John Bolton. This is the third security advisor Trump has fired. The president de announced the decision on Twitter, saying he disagreed strongly with many of Bolton's decisions. So John Bolton has been one of the most aggressive members of the Trump administration, pushing for more sanctions and even military action against Venezuela and Iran. Trump says he will announce his fourth advisor next week. Reporters, Press Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the reasons behind the dismissal and the resignation. Look, I, I, I don't talk about the inner workings of how, how this all goes. We, we all give our candid opinions. There were many times Ambassador Bolton and I disagree, that's to be sure. Uh, but that's true for lots of, lots of people who, with whom I interact. Just to follow up quickly on the original guidance for this briefing. <laughs> Bolton was on the guidance to be here. So were you two blindsided by what occurred today? That he's no longer with the administration? Was it news to you today? Because last night you were told he would be here today. Yeah, I I'm never surprised. <laughs> <laughs> The Venezuelan armed forces have started military exercises on the border with Colombia. On Friday night, President Nicolás Maduro met with the National Defense Council to agree on the lines of action to protect national sovereignty and the security of Venezuela. He said this follows numerous attempts coming from Colombia to fabricate incidents on the border as a pretext for military action. These include 42 actions recorded within the last three months with the collaboration of civilian and military traders. I want our people to be well informed. We are taking all necessary decisions and denouncing these attacks to all levels. We have the evidence that proves that there is a conspiracy in Colombia in order to attack the public sectors in Venezuela. We have the evidence that shows how in the last three months, Colombia's intelligence services has tried to recruit Venezuelan officials in order to attack our radar system, air defense system, and the Venezuelan missile system for these days. At the United Nations in Geneva, the Cuban and Venezuelan governments responded to the latest version of the UN Human Rights Report on Venezuela. The Cuban representative expressed solidarity on behalf of the ALBA Alliance. In the name of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of our America, ALBA, we once again condemn the unprecedented campaign of aggression against Venezuela, which seeks to overthrow the Bolivarian government and dismantle the social and political gains of Hugo Chavez, which have been maintained by the government of President Nicolás Maduro. This campaign not only denies the obvious achievements of the Bolivarian Revolution, it also seeks to demonize any independent political alternative in Latin America and the Caribbean. The authors of this campaign are politically motivated and use this issue of human rights in a hypocritical way to undermine genuine democracy in Venezuela and justify a military intervention. The Venezuelan ambassador to the UN in Geneva spoke on behalf of the non-aligned movement. In the name of the movement of non-aligned countries, we welcome the decision of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to strengthen even further the constructive commitment with member states in bilateral and multilateral human rights. We also agree with the need to defend the universal application of human rights in an impartial way, without distinction, and with the constant revision of the achievements and weakness in human rights of all the member states. Moving on, the number of people who have been killed by Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas has climbed to 50. A statement released by the Commissioner of Royal Bahamas Police Force says 42 bodies have been found in Abaco, while eight were recovered in Grand Bahama. Many remain missing as relief efforts are still underway in the affected islands. Spokesperson for the National Emergency Management Agency, Carl Smith, reiterated that the death toll is the official number confirmed by the police. The official death toll comes from the police. The information to date is that there are 50 persons officially declared dead. We expect that there will be more. But, you know, we have to be responsible, respectful, and follow proper procedures. 
National Security Minister of the Bahamas, Marvin Daines, has responded to claims that authorities have underreported the death toll. Daines says authorities are responsible for reporting what has been confirmed and will continue to release bodies to victims' relatives. And I want us to be extremely careful, you know, that we are dealing with persons who would have gone through a wide range of emotions. And when we put this information out there in social media and in other spheres, you know, it further complicates uh, things. And it gives the impression as if the authorities are, and I've, been, I've heard um, some person say, well, they're hiding the bodies. Or they're, why would we do that? Just tell me, what will it gain us to do such a thing? You know, and so we have to, we have to, you know, we have to take hold of this and, and always, when, when anything we print or anything we say, keep in mind those who would have, would have endured tremendous loss. Once we can identify the bodies, um, and that's what the detectives are seeking to do, uh, with health personnel. So when we, once we are able to identify the bodies, uh, it is our intention to release the bodies to the family. We're not, we're not going to stack up bodies on bodies. You know, if we can identify them, uh, we will go through that process of, of releasing so that, you know, families can, can move forward with their lives. But anger and frustration is mounting among displaced Haitians living in the Bahamas who had, who had their lives appended by Hurricane Dorian. Their large immigrant community in Marsh Harbor was whipped away by the hurricane. Some Haitian migrants are now living on the streets, while others have sought temporary shelter in a church. From this morning, I only drank a cup of tea from this morning. Look up the time right now. All right, they put me there, I don't know nothing. Nobody don't say nothing about us. I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to say and what to do. So I need help. We could try and find jobs. A lot of us, we lost our passport, we lost documents and everything. So it's now, it'd be hard to find jobs with no documents. We'll be right back, stay with us. In El Salvador, feminist movements have taken to the streets against the Attorney General's request to reopen the case of Evelyn Hernández. Ernesto Ábalos has the details. A number of feminist movements protested in front of the Attorney General's office against the public ministry's decision to reopen the case of Evelyn Hernández. Hernández was accused of homicide for the death of her son when she was giving birth. She was freed on August 16, and now with this appeal presented by the public ministry, feminist organizations have decided to protest against this decision. The protest turned a bit violent as some of the women there threw stones, red paint, and other objects toward the Attorney General's office. The country's Attorney General, Raul Malera, has said that these actions only demonstrate there are no legal resources to defend Evelyn Hernandez. He also said they will continue to second the penal chamber with the request to reopen the case. In the days that follow, we will know the decision whether it will be in favor of Evelyn or if it will side with the public ministry. In Honduras, protesters came under attack by police in the capital, Tegucigalpa, over the construction of a luxury housing complex. Residents say it would endanger one of the main water sources of the city. Thousands of protesters blocked the road near the construction site in La Tigra National Park, demanding authorities to withdraw the project. The park is one of the capital's most biodiverse areas. According to environmental organizations, the project would see 1,800 housing units and about 30 commercial centers put up inside the park. Moving on, protesters took to the streets of Buenos Aires, Argentina as part of a union strike and asking for relief from the spiraling economy. 
Members of the country's largest trade unions walked off their jobs as part of the strike. For the past year, the country's economy has been reeling from recession and fears grow of a debt, of a debt default. Protesters carried banners slamming President Mauricio Macri's economic austerity policies, rising poverty, mass layoffs, and a $57 billion deal with the IMF they say has only aggravated these issues. Si el gobierno. The government can end hunger in homes today simply by doubling the universal allowance for a child from 2,500 to 5,600 pesos. But they don't do this. And why? Because hunger and poverty are a mechanism to keep people fighting for their survival and limit their ability to think of the future. As workers, we want a society that doesn't exclude, that is inclusive and just. That is why we are fighting. On Monday, Colombia commemorated the National Day of Human Rights. This came during a time when the country lives a humanitarian crisis that has taken the life of 149 social leaders in 2019 alone. Human rights experts blame an increase of paramilitary groups and systematic state abandonment as reasons for the situation. According to official figures, 149 social leaders have been killed in Colombia in 2019 alone. The murders have taken place in 89 municipalities where the situation remains critical. These are places where drug trafficking and illegal economies are thriving. In the last three weeks, in the last three weeks, there have been over 35 murders of social leaders and political candidates, two mayoral candidates who were killed recently. So we can call this terrorism. This course promoting war is also on the rise because we are allegedly threatened by foreign powers. According to the Electoral Observation Mission, since July 27th until now, there have been 38 candidates who have fallen victims to violence, including six murders. We have a total of 364 leaders, including pre-candidates, who have been victims of violence or threats, as well as murders. We have seen that as time goes by, that where there is violence against politicians, there is also violence against social leaders. One of those involved in this wave of violence is the FARC party, which has seen 145 of its former combatants murdered since the signing of the peace agreement in 2016. On more than one occasion, we have asked the president to sit with us to talk about the agreement, to talk about the implementation of effective measures of the dismantling of paramilitary groups that exist in our country. They are the ones generating terror in Colombia. The paramilitary groups are the ones that are killing us. For many, the outlook in Colombia is not encouraging as the government continues to look for enemies abroad to justify the murder of social leaders. The third international trade union forum of solidarity with Syria ended this Monday in Damascus. The gathering saw the participation of Cuba, Canada and beyond. Let's have a look. 100 trade union delegations from around the world convened in Damascus, condemning the foreign terrorist war and an economic blockade directly affecting the lives of the Syrian people. In solidarity with the Syrian people, they agreed to develop a worldwide campaign taking aim at the governments and states which support terrorism, impose a human blockade on Syria, and while also manipulating the narrative on Syria. Participants of the event commended Syrian workers for being true combatants of their homeland at a time of war. They were lauded for maintaining their jobs in factories and other work in spite of the constant threat of terrorist attacks that up to date have resulted in the deaths of more than 9,000 workers, the wounding of another 14,000, while 3,000 were kidnapped by extremist groups. On behalf of workers of their respective countries, trade union representatives present in the forum urged the international community to support the Syrian people against the hostile, aggressive and interventionist policies of Washington and its allies against Syria.
They were not able to bring down Syria with war, and even today they cannot break the Syrian people through the blockade and the sanctions. The Syrian people do not lower their guard despite all the challenges, and we are confident that they will continue their fight until they triumph. They will not cease to support their leadership and national army. We denounce the media campaign which exists throughout this process that is being developed by the people of Syria. Undoubtedly, we believe that in all the nations which have a presence here, they will be able to learn more about the realities and situation here. Without a doubt, the position of Cuba will be a position of firm support for the process taking place. Your sanctions, uh, as I mentioned before, on Syria are taking place in so many other parts of the world. It's, it's completely unacceptable. And uh, the, the Canadian, uh, Canadian labor movement uh, does support the people in Syria. And it, it, we're here to, to, to put pressure to take the sanctions away. The war and the blockade have caused state losses, which exceed $90 billion. Still, Syria's government has not abandoned the social and economic subsidy policy and has continued paying the employee wages. Meanwhile, workers continue to stand firm. They've resolved to rebuild their country, a lesson in firmness and resistance to the entire world. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Palestinian leaders have denounced as a war crime plans by Benjamin Netanyahu to annex a large swathe of the West Bank if he wins next week's elections in Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister says he will immediately apply Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley and the Northern Dead Sea if voters back him at the polls next to Tuesday. Around 65,000 Palestinians live in those areas which Israel occupied in the 1967 war. Netanyahu said he he would wait for an agreement with President Trump before annexing other areas of the West Bank. What Prime Minister Netanyahu said tonight about asking his people for a mandate to allow that will enable him to annex the Jordan Valley uh, is paramount to a war crime. Annexation of occupied territories is a war crime. So Mr. Netanyahu and those who help or aid Mr. Netanyahu in such a vision of annexing Jerusalem, annexing Hebron, annexing the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and then keeping Palestinians in their small towns and villages as prisoners without any freedom, uh, that is a war crime. And as, about, uh, as we are about to enter the 74th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations, the international community must stand tall now, all, to say a big no and to stop treating Israel as a country above the laws of man. And the Arab League has said that Netanyahu's plans to annex large parts of the West Bank will derail the Israeli-Palestine peace process. The League Secretary General Ahmed Geit told journalists in Cairo on Tuesday that Netanyahu's announcement is in violation of international law and represents a new aggression against Palestine by the government of Israel. He added that the League will use all means to oppose any Israeli policy that seeks to grab Palestinian territory. A statement from the Council of the Arab League on the ministerial level in an irregular emergency session regarding the announcement of the Prime Minister of the Israel occupation about his intention of annexing parts of the occupied West Bank for Israel sovereignty. Cairo, September 10, 2019. The statement stipulates that the Arab League Ministerial Council, which met in an irregular emergency session, expresses its deep condemnation and absolute rejection of the announcement made by the Prime Minister of the Israeli occupation on the evening of Tuesday, September 10, 2019. Regarding his intentions of annexing parts of the occupied West Bank of the year 1967, the Council considers this announcement has a dangerous progression and a new Israel aggression, one that violates international law. The United Nations declaration, as well as legitimate international decisions such as Security Council Decision Number 338 and 242, the Council considers these statements as undermining any chances of progress in the peace process, completing eradicating its foundation. 
The Council announces its determinations to follow up with these new aggressive Israel statements, as well as its readiness to undertake all procedures, legal and political actions to resist this Israel policy, which aims to increase conflict and violence in the region. Arab action will be taken with the Security Council, the General Assembly of the United Nations, international organizations, and members of the international community. The UN Refugee Agency and the African Union have signed a deal with Rwanda to host hundreds of migrants being held in Libya. According to a joint statement, a first group of 500 people will be evacuated, including children and youth at risk. Other evacuation flights for those willing to go to Rwanda are expected to begin in the coming weeks. Officials say over 4,000 people are estimated to be held in dire conditions in detention centers in Libya. Foreign nationals in South Africa's Cattle Hong Township have sought refuge in community halls after being displaced by a, wave of, uh, by a recent wave of xenophobic violence. According to officials, about 150 people were forced to leave their homes that were robbed and burned to the ground. At least 12 people were killed by the surge of anti-foreigner violence in Johannesburg, the country's financial capital, last week. Foreign nationals have repeatedly called for support from the South African government and regional bodies. I'm very scared. But in the news they are saying the, the, the fighting was finished, but we are still fighting. They are fighting with us, even today. So what I'm asking now, I'm, I'm homeless. They bent everything that was belongs to me. It's only that I'm, I thank God because I'm still alive. Once I get out of this garden, sometimes I'll get a shot. Some of the guys, their properties were not burned there by the location. But when they tried to go with the police to take their positions back, they were shot. You know, we were under a very serious, serious threat. But I don't know what's going on with the government because the government is just taking a little step and little step. In a rare public appearance, the president of Cameroon, Paul Biya, has announced major national dialogue to end conflict in the country. Over the past two years, the ongoing conflict between security forces and armed separatists from the Anglophone minority in the West has left over 2,000 people dead. That's why I have decided to convene, at the end of this month, a major national dialogue that will enable us, within the limits of our constitution, to examine ways and means of meeting the deep aspirations of the peoples of the Northwest and Southwest, but also of all the other components of our nation. A United Nations independent human rights expert has charged that Qatar still has a long way to go in addressing the widespread abuse of migrant domestic workers. Speaking during a workshop for migrant workers' rights, Obiora Okafor said while the situation has improved, much more still needs to be done. A recent report by the International Organization for Migration, physical and mental abuse of migrant workers is rampant across the Middle East. According to the report, workers frequently face having their passports confiscated and restrictions on their movements and communication. Many domestic workers continue to work long hours. Some of them have reported up to 16 hours daily with few realistic avenues to protest, despite this being prohibited by the law. Many are denied mobile phones by employers, hindering their access to the outside world. The body of Zimbabwe's former president, Robert Mugabe, has left the funeral parlor in Singapore and will be flown home on Wednesday. The plane carrying his body will leave Singapore on Wednesday morning and it is expected to arrive in Zimbabwe in a late afternoon. According to reports, Mugabe's family is against the government's plan to bury him at the National Heroes Acre Monument in Harare, preferring his home village. A state funeral will be held on Saturday in Harare before burial, scheduled for the following day on Sunday. The final place of burial has not yet been confirmed. The body is expected in Zimbabwe, Harare Airport, the Robert Capri Mugabe Airport, anytime on Wednesday, 11 September 2019. On Thursday, which is the 12th, and Friday, the 13th September, 
the body will be taken to the farm stadium to allow members of the public from all our provinces to pay their last respects to the illustrious Liberation War here. Saturday, 14 September 2019, the body will be at the National Sports Stadium for the state funeral service, where Zimbabweans and other foreign dignitaries and members of the diplomatic corps will have an opportunity to pay their last respects to our departed hero. Burial is set for the 15th September 2019 which is And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesor English, I am Stefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.